So last time we have seen the way in which evolution had advanced from the void, the inconscience, the indeterminate, then slowly the appearance of matter, of life, of mind, with the possibility of what might happen, what is going to happen, or what should happen in future. It felt a Godhead in its fragile house. It saw blue heaven, dreamed immortality. So that is the prospect also of this early evolution. Now, we have a fairly detailed description of the nature of the subconscient life in the dream consciousness the subconscious part is important we are not aware of it but below our surface consciousness there is a whole world of life with its complications, with desires, wants, power, struggles, all the elements are present in. Even the presence of what we would call the shut repuse, the five, the six blemishes in human nature, all those are present in the subconscious life. So now the new para is describing us those details in a very rapid, quick manner. Now these are extremely important and not that all is new here in Savitri, the Indian tradition, the Indian psychology, Indian spiritual knowledge is fairly well aware of most of the subconscious workings of which no idea, no inkling is there in the Western psychology. When they deal with human nature, human psychology, they do not know the sub-layers of life working in us and from where all the things spring up. Sometimes a glimpse of it is seen in dreams, sometimes in our daily activities, but there is no hold available for the Western psychology to understand the details. So from that point of view, it is necessary that any study of human psychology should understand these details also. A conscious soul in the inconscient world, a certain surface formation has occurred. The surface ego personality of man has developed. But below that consciousness, the surface consciousness, there are depths and depths and depths of various workings and that is what we are going to see here. A conscious soul in the inconscient world, hidden behind our thoughts and hopes and dreams, our longings of life, our dreams, what we would like to have, our way of thinking, how our mind itself is governed, that is what is now totally hidden from us, hidden behind our thoughts and hopes and dreams, how they emerge and govern these things, control our movements, that is what is going to be described here. An indifferent master signing nature's acts, live the wise gerent mind, a seeming king. We think we are master thing. 
our mind knows everything and we feel happy also that it is mind which is going to govern all these things but it is not so most of the time mind is governed by the subconscious forces by the subconscious elements after all mind is only a wise gerent he is working there in place of the sovereign is the sovereign soul is not present there wise gerent he is exercising the power or the authority of the sovereign or the monarch who is absent or he is not available for the work immediately and it is that mind we think that he is the master of everything but that is not really so and indifferent master sanning nature's acts whatever prakriti says he sanctions them he approves it he puts his signature he puts his thumb mark on that he does not know what he is doing he is a king but he thinks then sorry he is a vice president a deputy who has been appointed to carry out a certain work in the absence of the sovereign but he thinks that he is the master he is the king and all shall be according to his will according to his thought his wishes whatever he wants to do that will be done that is what he think but it is not so actually this vice president himself is governed by the subconscious elements and he does not know that we think that we are thinking independently but even in our daily life we know that all the shadrupus act in a certain manner and govern our thinking our actions our movements everything you see and in different mass assigning nature's acts leave the vice gerent mind a seeming king now this vice gerent is a very apt phrase very beautiful phrase it has also great historical associations connotations echoes of how the religions developed and how they thought themselves to be the deputies of god the quran says mankind is the vice gerent of allah of god we are deputies of god and we are acting on his behalf that is what the muslim scripture says the byzantine emperors during the christian era they always considered themselves asserted themselves they are the wise gerents of guide god they were deputed by the divine himself to rule the world that was their assertion in fact this went on even as late as 17th 18th century charles i he asserted in england that he is there as a monarch providentially ordained he has been put there in the power by god himself and nobody can touch him that is what he asserted when there was a fight between the british parliament and the monarch he asserted that he has all the powers in him and the parliament has no business to interfere in his activities and work well that is the kind of an arrogance people had developed they thought they are the vice gerents of the supreme himself and acted the way they liked and what was the finally soon he was executed he had to pay the price also now this is the play of the vital forces byzantine emperors 
in fact emperors they always asserted to that even we in india always say that the king is ruling the country on behalf of god and we worship him like that in that manner you see but we never made a distinction that there are kings and kings that a king can be possessed by the vital power and it is he whom we are worshiping that would not do that discernment has to be there in us who is the real king if he is a king like ashwapati like janak they are vibhutis one can understand that but not any king see so this mind thinks that he is the vice president and he can sanction authorize do whatever he likes as far as the work of nature is concerned and in different master sanning nature's acts leave the vice president mind a seeming king now of course there is a brighter side also of the vice president as i said some of these noble kings were the real vice presidents in paradise lost milton's paradise lost he calls christ the son of god he is the real vice president he is the deputy of god who has come here for a certain work in india we call him an avatar he is one who has come directly from the supreme for the work of the supreme which he would be doing here now that is a different grade of a vice president but most of the time in our ordinary human life it is the appropriation of power by the ruling head it is a vital force which is governing all this thing therefore here the mind says that he is the vice president and in different master signing nature's acts leave the vice president mind a seeming king see how exact the phrasing is mathematically precise every word every detail see in his floating house this king his house is not steady mind is never stable it goes on from thought to thought constantly it is drifting with emotions with feelings with various inputs which he gets he keeps on shifting all the while in his floating house upon the sea of time this regent sits at work and never rests that is his nature that is how it happens here he is acting on behalf of a power and he thinks that he is the master regent this regent sits at work and never rests he is a puppet of the dance of time he is driven by the hours from moment to moment from second to second he is governed by some other forces he does not know but he thinks that he is a regent he is driven by the hours the moments a call compels him with the thronging of life's need what the ni- life needs it is that need that force of life it is that which moves his actions and thinking it happens very often you like something you justify it by giving mental arguments that yes is it is very good very beautiful it will be useful like that it will be useful like that we keep on justifying what we like where life has entered in it is in justification of that mind is employed in other words basically life is using mind to justify her wants and desires and ambitions and mind is supporting the lives ambitions and desires and wants all the while he is driven by the hours the moments a call compels him with the thronging of lives and need and the babble of the voices of the world he goes by what the world is asking for 
by the desires the way want this mind what is this character this mind knows silence knows is a noisy mind all the while this mind knows silence knows not dreaming anything he does not know dreamless sleep this mind no silence knows nor dreamless sleep now metrically also this is a very beautiful line this mind no silence knows nor dreamless sleep see the beat of the whole line this mind no silence knows nor dreamless sleep see very beautiful rhythm also and the movement of the whole thing in the incessant circling of his steps thoughts straight forever to the listening brain in his mind constantly they keep on haunting him it toys like a machine and cannot stop when the machine has been set rolling it must move on and on and on unless the switch is put off it has to run it is like that that is the mind this mind no silence knows no dreaming uh, no dreamless sleep in the incessant suffering of his sleep thoughts straight forever to the listening brain it toys like a machine and cannot stop now this is also very pertinent it happens all the while in us mind is restless mind is constantly thinking of this or that constantly imagining various aspects pros and cons of the events and moments and like that constantly it is thinking of that in fact it is impossible to meditate for man without any thought entering into his head even for 2 minutes constantly is flooded by external thoughts now the beauty is the trouble is the reality is the mind thinks that he is the thinker he is producing thoughts the thoughts are arising from his head from his mind that is not true thoughts come to you from outside thoughts visit you they come from wow or the spring up from below thoughts spring up from below from the subconscious or they come from above they come to you from outside of you they are not born in you you receive them but you think that they are your thoughts you are thinking all those things it is not so really now <clears throat> that is exactly what shebandu had in his very first very major spiritual experiences in baroda around 1st january 1908 when he was sitting with lele for 3 days in total isolation from with everybody lele told him remain silent remain quiet and you will see that the thoughts are arriving stop them and you will be able to stop them also entering in you the silent mind was a major experience shebandu had right in the beginning of his spiritual journey it is this silent mind which shebandu had given as a present to the mother when they met for the first time on 29th march 1914 they had a meeting and she suddenly saw that her mind had fallen silent silent does not mean stupid it means it will not allow all kind of stupid things to enter in you it knows that thoughts are coming you can stop them entering in you that was the first present shivandu had given to the mother in 1914 and he had himself that experience realization in 
Now, this is important in Shevandu's Yoga. For a real yogic beginning of the spiritual kind, this is the first experience one has to have, the silent mind. Then the other thing will follow. Now here Savitri is seeing in her dream consciousness, in her Swapna Avastha, that these are the thoughts coming from outside. This mind, no silence knows, no dreamlessly, in the incessant suffering of his steps, thoughts straight forever to the listening brain, they come from outside thoughts. It toys like a machine and cannot stop thought brain. Into the body's many storied rooms, there are chambers in our body's house, chambers after chamber, in this room, in that room, in that room. Subconscious sub pockets are there in us. In any of the sub pockets, these things are happening. Into the body's many storied rooms, endless crowd down, the dream gods messages. You receive intimations, messages from various regions, from the subconscious, and your mind is uh, not alert enough to see what is what, what is to be taken, what should be rejected. Mind has no capacity of that kind. Only it knows how to sign for nature to do this or that. He is a vice gerent only. All is a hundred tone murmur and babble and stir. Constantly the noise is going on in your brain. A hundred tone murmur. Constantly there is that murmur going on in your head to flicker. And babble and stir that moment. There is a tire running to and fro. Our thoughts go back and forth all the while, to and fro. A haste of movement and a ceaseless cry. The hurried servant senses answer apace. You think of something, you see something, and suddenly the sense responds to that. Senses, they are the doors to see the outside world. And they receive all kind of details, information, inputs and they keep on feeding your mind. Manas, his faculties are the five senses, all the five senses. They receive, you hear, you see, you taste, you touch, you feel, all those things are there. And these senses bring their own inputs and feed the mind and mind keeps on wandering with them, do this or do that. The hurry servant senses answer a face very quickly, fast. They answer quickly. To every knock upon the outer doors, bring in life visitors, report each call. See a beautiful scenery. Suddenly, the vision brings a certain impression to your mind, and mind starts thinking. You hear something and mind again starts thinking of that. So constantly the mind is going, is depending upon what the senses bring to it. Bringing lies visitors, report each call, admit the thousand queries and the calls. Each one is demanding something of its own. You see a tree and is telling, look, today I was not watered. See, it's like that. And then you start running that. You see something, the bird is there. Look, today I did not get a grain of sand, a grain of rice to eat. You start attending. So that is what the mind keeps on thinking and doing by seeing all these objects. To every knock upon the outer doors, bring live visitors, report each call, admit a thousand queries, and the calls and the messages of communicating minds and heavy business of unnumbered lives 
and all the thousandfold karmas of the world, these are constantly flooding mind. And who is bringing that information? Those, it is the senses to the mind, and mind is getting flooded with that. Even in the tracks of sleep, even if you are not awake, while in the jagrata you see all that thing. When you are asleep, the mind falls silent, but not the inner activity. The subconscious movement keeps on going. They will rush through dreams into you. Even in the tracks of sleep, is scant repose. There is hardly any repose. That bombardment, that flooding, is constantly there, whether you are awake or whether you are asleep. He marks life steps in strange subconscious dreams. You start seeing all kinds of dreams, good dreams, ugly dreams, and you start running after that. You get frightened, you get related, you see beautiful color things, colorful things also. You have nightmares, you get scared. Somebody is rushing with a dagger at you, you get frightened. All those things are there in the dreams. He strays in a sublime realm of symbol scenes. He is night with thin air visions and dim forms he packs or peoples with light drifting shame and only a moment spends in silent self hardly a moment well actually this is what happens when you go to sleep you go through various regions of sleep to dream consciousness down 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 below and when you are really in deep repose, then you have true rest, true sleep, dreamless sleep, where nothing disturbs you. And that is the real part of the sleep which nourishes you in every respect. When you wake up, it is that which makes you fresh. Otherwise, you are constantly flooded, even in dream. And only a small little, maybe hardly five minutes, ten minutes, you get that true rest in the sleep. And only a moment spends in silent self when everything is shut off from you. Nothing enters in you. That is a very rare moment in sleep also, every day. See. Adventuring into infinite mind, sorry, adventuring into infinite mind space, he unfolds his wings of thought in inner air. When you go inside, what happens with the inner thought? You move again in the same manner. He unfolds his wings of thought in inner air or traveling in imagination's car, crosses the globe. You go to different places. From one continent to the other continent, you move swiftly in dreams. Journeying beneath the stars, you even cross the spaces and go to different stars in sleep. Subtle worlds takes his ethereal course. You take the, you start moving into the subtle worlds also in the dream stream. Visits the gods on life's miraculous peaks. Communicates with heaven. Tampers with hell. Well, this can happen in the dream state. You can go to various places in the dream, to heaven, to hell, to different regions in the space. Adventuring into infinite mind space, he unfolds his wings of thought in inner air, or traveling in imagination's car, crosses the globe, journeys beneath the stars, to subtle worlds, takes his ethereal course, visits the gods on life's miraculous peaks, communicates with heaven, tampers with hell. This is the little surface of man's life. This is what we live here on the surface. We have access to all those regions in our subconscious. But we are not aware of the sources of those activities or those moments, how they come and impinge in our waking state of that 
we have no knowledge and you so we have been seeing the description of the wise ignorant mind mind acting on behalf of the sovereign or the monarch he is not in station actually we could say that we are looking at what the gita would call the kshara purusha purusha in the hands of prakriti he is permanently there he is always there but in the hands of prakriti the lower nature particularly so this wise gerent mind will simply sign the papers given to him by nature whatever she wants him to do that he will sign his sanction his approval is necessary without that prakriti cannot function but at the same time he is governed by the lower nature so what we are here is the description of the lower nature in fact this is the little surface of man's life whatever is being described here of man and the mind approving the works of nature it is only the description of the surface consciousness of man the life on the surface or the sub or the life gathered around the ego center the surface soul it is that what we are witnessing here rather that is what savitri is seeing in the dream consciousness at one particular stage here this is the little surface of man's life he is this and he is all the universe he is case the unseen his depths are his depths they are the abyss a whole mysterious world is locked within he is case the unseen his depths they are the abyss so there is a double moment what we have been calling the surface consciousness below the surface consciousness it is subconscient above the surface consciousness it is subliminal now it is both which are simultaneously present in us and therefore there is the possibility of scaling the unseen at the same time there is the danger of dipping slipping falling into the abyss he scaled the unseen he depths dared the abyss a whole mysterious world is locked within this is what we have got within us the moment you step down from the surface consciousness these domains open to us the subconscient and the subliminal in fact this is an important distinction that below our waking consciousness below the jagrata condition in the dream state in the swapna we have both simultaneously present a fact which is not recognized by the western psychology for the freudian psychologists they are only the subconscious below and it is a repository of all our conditions of our dreams thoughts emotions feelings ideas hatred jealousy love whatever you want to call it they are all submerged in the subconscious we become emotional because of that we have anger we have got sweetness we have got love all those things according to the freudian psychology belong to the subconscious and it is from that desire 
from that particular pool of our consciousness that we get intimations and we act according to them freudian repository for socially unacceptable ideas they are present in the subconscious wishes desires traditions traumatic experience fear anger they are all present here emotions they are all deposited in the subconscious now that is the only thing which the western psychology at the time of freud recognized but later an important distinction was made by jung he made a distinction between the individual subconscious and the collective subconscious according to him there is the personal unconsciousness there is also the collective unconsciousness and it is these two which govern not only the movements of the individual but also of the collective group now for them the way to cure things coming from this conscient lies in specific kind of auto suggestions by making certain types of affirmations no 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 this is not good i will not go by that we mentally keep on insisting that this is not good for me let me throw it away by auto suggestion you keep on think for yourself yes whatever is going to happen to me is going to be good 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 there will be nothing bad you keep on making auto suggestion and it is that way then all the impulses which rise which rush up from below they are suppressed they are thrown back that is the way by which they recommend us to overcome the subconscious influences now all these things actually form a very elaborate realm of consciousness down below and shebendu has described these things in great details in his writings in the synthesis of yoga in many other places and of course in hundreds of letters to the disciples what is subconscious what is the origin what influences the me how the dreams can be changed how this can be purified these are the certain things which are necessary for you to get the minimum basis for making a spiritual beginning of in life without that shanti peace quiet which are required they would not come so they had to be dealt with and he has described many of these things in his letters in fact all the details have been given out by him in his letters in fact in the vital region he describes four layers of the vital subconscious full of all these possibilities one has the mental vital vital having the mind or mind having the life force the mental vital then of course the emotional vital whose center is in the heart mental vital is in the thread in the throat and above the emotional heart is here actually the emotional feeling emotional consciousness emotional subconscious is at the heart but at the heart we have got two things one is the emotional vital the other one is deep within the heart what is called traditionally in the cave of the heart is the psychic being the spark of the divine sitting within us inside the heart so he is not talking here at this stage about the psychic being which is deep inside the heart but the outside heart which is governed by the vital so you have got the mental vital you have got then the emotional vital then of course below that is the central vital 
the central vital comes between the heart center and the navel down below belly mostly that is the central vital where all kinds of things happen emotions anger jealousy mada moha matsara as we call them shadow repose they are all present in the lower consciousness lust hatred at the same time sweetness joy to some extent for others they are all present over there then below the navel is what is called the lower vital and that is below the navel between the navel and down below is the lower vital so there are four regions of the vital the mental vital the emotional vital the central vital and the lower vital now it is in these regions all these emotions and all these things appear here basically the problem of our personality lies in purifying all that is present in these regions in the subconscious because even if you make a progress they will come and mass your progress they will hold your progress they will hold you back from progress so it is also necessary to some extent to constantly keep on purifying them in the traditional yogas different methods have been prescribed by different paths by bhakti by jnana and other things but the most traditional path is the raja yoga or patanjali's yoga in a yoga sutra he describes four or five first preliminary basic steps yama niyama then asana pratyahara dhyana dharana samadhi these are the various stages he is describing in the case of purification of the mental being in fact yama niyama asana pranayama pratyahara dharana dhyana and then samadhi these are the eight aspects of patanjali's yoga so first is of course yama having regular habits regular disciplined life governing things in a certain definite manner so that the system is properly used up then of course you have got niyama you follow certain rules certain stipulations of life certain principles in life and asana keep the body straight erect steady so that it is able to receive what is being brought to it to see you have pratyahara avoid all that will come and disturb you that is required stop anything coming to you like that that is required is pratyahara then of course dhyan dhyadharana pratyahara stop don't accept for instance now as a simple example of pratyahara somebody gives you present frankly in the truest sense if you are not very well prepared the best thing is avoid receiving presents and gifts avoid because there is certain kind of an obligation on you then to pay it back in some manner simply receiving the gifts is not enough is not necessary but of course later on as you advance you can overcome that thing you can still be above that thing but that obligation should not be there pratyahara somebody okay take this banana but he is not giving you banana for nothing he wants something in return from you tomorrow so the best thing is stop that kind of a thing don't have that lust that ambition that desire that wish that i should receive gifts and praise and the sort of a thing that should not be there at all is it so these are the certain aspects of the disciplined life which are recommended in the yoga sutra of patanjali and all these has something or the other to do with the subconscious which is there within us and that is the greatest domain which is very difficult to conquer very difficult to overcome and be free of it unless one is mukta free of that one cannot really make spiritual progress that is the whole point the whole basis of the whole thing you see now in in order that you are free you can of course 
formulation rules, certain mental formulations, have discipline, stiff life, and that sort of a thing. But then it has a certain limits also. According to Shabindu and the mother, the best thing is to keep on making your being, yourself, more and more open to the psychic. Let the psychic come forward and take possession of you. It is the psychic which will purify all the subconscious elements, you see. Or in the Vedic tradition, it is Agni who purifies the whole of your being. That tapas, Agni Shakti, Agni's power, is fire. It is that which will burn away all these lower things which are residing within you, in the subconscious. So these are the important aspects from the point of view of a spiritual life, the beginning of spiritual life, that is important. And of course naturally along with that come last greed, covetousness, possession, mother, moha, matsara, kama, krodha, all those things, self are there, they had to be conquered by the psychic influence in Shabandhu's methodology, in Shabandhu's yoga, you see. And when that is ready, then some sort of a real progress is possible. If you don't do that thing, but if you keep on making advances in other direction, you might attain great spiritual heights. You might get spiritual experiences also. But if the lower nature is not yet ready in that way, something can upsurge, can spring up, and damage, cause havoc at higher level also. This is a thing which is not uncommon. It has happened in the past. We have seen great rishis who have done tapasya for years and years and years, acquired great samarthya, siddhis in their life, in their tapas. But then there is something sometimes happens and then they fall prey to that parashara. Vishwamitra, these are the examples that fallen prey to the sex and they had to pay the price for that. But that does not mean that they could not immediately withdraw. By their tapas, by their shakti, they could overcome that thing and conquer. But basically what it means is that these elements are present there and they can spring up, rise from below any moment of time and it is necessary that they have to be attended, particularly when you want transformation, you want a basic change in you. Unless that thing is done, you cannot make proper progress. Transformation, that is why Mother and Shepinu have been insisting all along that the first step is to have a psychic transformation in the spiritual path. You psychicize your mind, your vital, your physical, all the elements, let the psychic influence penetrate through all these regions, then you can make a proper real progress. Well, now this is the description of all these things which is being given to us here in uh, the dream experience of Savitri. He is narrating what is subconscious, what are the forces which are present in the subconscious and how they govern man's spiritual life. This is the little surface of man's life. He is this and he is all the universe. At the same time, the entire universe is in front of him. He is cased the unseen. He is depths there the abyss. The whole mysterious world is located within the above, below, everything is located within unknown to himself he lives a hidden king he doesn't know that he is a king and he lives at behind rich tapestries curtains, walls, carpets, luxuries behind rich tapestries in great secret rooms he lives a king in a palace with chandeliers, tapestries, with carpets, with beautiful furniture. This man, he lives in all these things. Unknown to himself, lives a hidden king behind these tapestries in great secret room. And epicure, all the spirits, unseen joys. He is an epicure. He is a connoisseur. 
he has very fine taste fine taste of not only food but of habits of beauty of the surroundings whether this book is in proper place or not where this furniture is prop in proper place or not he has got that delicate sense of every detail and he sees that everything is in proper place is it his hair is close everything he is an epicure in a sense an epicure that the spirits unseen joys this is what the king lives here he lives the sweet honey of solitude in nameless god in an unapproachable fain he is a god in a shrine in a temple in a village temple but very beautiful temple fain or chapel he lives there a church in the remote place a nameless god in an unapproachable fain in the secret at a time of his in must the soul the within his in the secret chamber at right arm the sanctum sanctorum the inner chamber where the real deity lives a nameless god in an inapproachable fain in the secret at right arm of his luminous soul in most the soul he guards the beings covered the mysteries beneath the threshold behind shadowy gates so below the surface consciousness underneath the subconscious he casts all these treasures there beneath the threshold beneath behind shadowy gate or shut in vast cellars of inconscient sleep he is in the down below in the room in the underground room in the basement he lives there all the while in the basement shut in cellars of inconscient sleep this is the condition he sees heaven above he sees hell below all these things are there here he guards the beings covered the mysteries the two fold mysteries of the above and of the below beneath the threshold behind shadowy gates or shut in vast cellars of inconscient sleep the immaculate divine all wonderful cast into the argent purity of his soul his splendor and his greatness and the light when he is in that condition the all wonderful the divine himself he pours light and beauty and joy into his soul his splendor and his greatness and the light of self creation in times infinity as into a sublimely mirroring glass the way in which he throw light in the mirror which will reflect everything it is in that way the all wonderful is pouring into his depths those wonders thing man in the world's life was out the dreams of god god is dreaming something in man and it is man who is executing carrying forward giving shape to do dreams but all is there while this is possible he is shaping the dreams of god still what happens but all is there even god supposes there are enemies there are hostile forces there are elements which will not allow you to accept only the beautiful and the great and the fine things of life and of existence but all is there even god supposes he is a little front of nature's works a thinking outline of a cryptic force he is only a shape a sketch of nature's force cryptic a mysterious shape he has made and this is what you are beyond that there are worlds and worlds and worlds hidden within you underneath you above you of which you are not aware but man is influenced by them is governed by them and savitri has to know all those things and man in the world's life works out the dreams of god the dreams of god being worked out by man 
in the works he is doing in life. What are the dreams of God? The future possibilities of the spirit entering into life. That is the main dream of God. Joy, love, beauty, knowledge, power, truth. These are the things which must enter into the works of man. And then only there is a fulfillment of his existence here. Now, this is what is being worked out by man as the present instrument in the hands of the spirit. But there are problems, there are difficulties. He has the past weighing on his shoulders. He is the product of the past. The baggage of the past he has to carry from life to life. The cosmic karma is there always with him and unless that is removed he cannot really make any true progress. Man in the world's life works out the dreams of God but all is there even God's opposites. That is the problem. It is not only the angels and the gods and the heavenly beings, the celestial beings, rishis, munis, sages. It is not only that. But there are devils, there are satans, there are hostile forces constantly working in the life of man. But all is there, even God's opposites. They have come into picture, not that they were created, but in the very nature of things, they had arisen from the inconscient origin of things. He is a little front of nature's works. After all, nature has been striving since the beginning to work out the will of the spirit in his creation and she has in the whole process arrived at the stage of a mental being giving to us man who is actually the bridge between the past and the future. He is a little friend of nature's words, a thinking outline of a cryptic force. He is a mental being, thinking outline, caricature of thought. In fact, even all the worlds of thought of mind are not present in the present mental being that is man. They have yet to enter and manifest. Powers of higher mind, illumined mind, intuition, the spiritual mind, they have not yet come into operation. He is still at a lower mental level. A thinking outline, therefore it's just an outline, of a cryptic force, cryptic, mysterious. She has kept everything back, hidden from man. He cannot understand her. But it is she who is really driving things around. Cryptic force, Shakti, the inconscient nature rising from below. It is she, nature, Apara Prakriti. It is she who has produced this particular world. All she reveals in him, that is in her. Whatever is present in that Prakriti, that lower nature, Apara, it is that which she has revealed, given to man, shown to him, disclosed in him. Her glory is walk in him. Obviously, love, beauty, joy, vela, majesty, vaibhava, all those things are her glories and they are his gifts from her. 
and at the same time her glory is walking in and her darknesses both of them are present simultaneously light and dark day and night gods and hostile forces hostile beings both are present and acting in the life of man her glory is walk in him and her darkness is man's house of life holds not the gods alone yes gods certainly are there but there are also inferior beings those type forces other beings satanic forces are there devious people are there full of jealousy hatred lust greed anger all those things are present in life there are occult shadows there are tenebrous powers dark powers powers of darkness occult shadows there's a very beautiful phrase occult gupta shadows chaya all the chaya beings all the higher nature are present and they are operating in him the occult shadows there are tenebrous powers inhabitants of lies ominous neither room they are occupying the lower worlds neither rooms satal the entire range of the lower creation sapta patal they come from them and enter into man's life shadowy worlds stupendous denizens they are the citizens of this darkness or the chaya world they are in fact you can say sapta patal if you like or sapta chaya seven grades of chaya are present and from each domain of the chaya or the shadow beings enter into the life of man a careless guardian of his nature's powers man harbors dangerous forces in his house he does not know but they are present in him all these dangerous forces are present in him he is not even aware of them when and how for what purpose you spring up you jump up you attack him he has no knowledge of it he cannot have knowledge of that thing because he is simply a small little thinking outline of the entire operation of nature the lower nature has all those worlds present in her and man harbors dangerous powers forces in his house the titan and the fury and the jinn lie bound in the subconscious cavern pit and the beast grovels in the anter then dark mutterings rise then mama in their drows this is a very ghastly picture very frightful picture of what man is facing well actually all these beings are present in us perhaps they are not present in us in that magnitude titan and fury and jinn in that full power in us we are small little creatures but this is what savitri is seeing in her dream consciousness she is seeing the cosmic past she is not seeing the past of you and me as individuals perhaps these frightful figures they don't even bother us they are not concerned in that sense there are smaller people smaller deities smaller deputies of them who will come and trouble us but these are beings operating at the cosmic level the titan and the fury and the jinn only for great people 
who bring out, bring about transformative actions in the working of nature, it is they who face these powers. Buddha faced Mara. It is, it is at that level things happen, not for us. People do great sadhana, great tapasya and all that. They are also affected to some extent by this. But this is on a cosmic scale that Savitri is seeing things happening. Her soul, her vision, her work is on the cosmic plane. And in the underworlds of the cosmos, these are the beings who are present. And she has to deal with them. Unless she deals with them, she cannot really meet the greatest being for which she has come to conquer, whom she has come to conquer, death, Yama. She has to face finally Yama. So in comparison with Yama, these are relatively small creatures, titans and fury and jinn. Now, titans are the primeval gigantic powers normally they are famous in the Greek mythology. There were twelve titans who ruled the ancient world. First, twelve titans. They are powers of great strength, great might, great will, great force. And it is under the sway that the entire creation went on. Later on, these twelve titans were defeated by the younger gods, the Olympians. And it is the reign of Olympians that are brought out in a visible manner, in a visible sense, in the Greek civilization. So these titans are the original primeval powers of the vital nature who are operating in the world world. And they are presenting, they had to be defeated by these younger gods. In that sense, one can again go back to the opening line of Savitri. It was the hour before the gods awake. These Olympian gods, they were not yet awake. Who was ruling them at the time? The Titans. These titans were ruling the entire world, the creation, and the gods were helpless. But when the younger gods awoke, then things started changing. So in that sense, the first line itself brings out all these aspects of the lower nature in a very powerful, very forceful manner. It was the hour before the gods awake. Before the gods awake were present, the titans and they had to be defeated. Kronos, Zeus' father himself, he had to defeat his father and hold and take the kingdom into his possession so that wisdom, light, higher quality in the spirit can come into the world's play. So this titan, this is what Savitri is seeing at that origin. The titan, the fury, they become angry. They will not allow you to carry out any ill will. They will pounce upon you. They will kill you, they will murder you, they will snatch you away. They will hang you. Same with the jinns. Jinns basically belong to the Arabic tradition, Jinai from the brass lamp, old brass lamp, you rub it and the Janai appears and he will fulfill your three wishes. Whatever he had three wishes, he will grant you the moon of three wishes. You can ask for whatever you like and he will do everything for you. Because the Janai who was trapped in the lamp has been freed by you and then he will grant you. Later on, of course, 
he will swallow you also, perhaps. <laughs> See? So, uh, these are the jinns. Because only Solomon, King Solomon, the wise one, who rubbed the lamp and the genine, would have come and killed. But he didn't do that. He took that lamp and threw away into the sea so that the jinn, the jinnaya, whatever, was permanently drowned into the sea. He could not become free, you see. So these are the beautiful powers residing in the underworld. And Savitri is seeing all those things. The titan and the fury and the jinn lie bound in the lamp. They are now trapped permanently in the bottle or whatever you call it. They are permanently trapped there. The subconscious cavern pit in the lower nature, subconscious, what Savitri is saying, subconscious. And the beast grovels in the anter den. Beast being capital. It is the full animal force, vital force, which is in operation. And he is, he is grovelling. He is crouching on the floor and entering into his den, and into his den, into his cave, into his recess, where he stays, like a lion who goes and stays in his cave. It is that beast who is now entering into his cave. And the beast crawls in his anchor den. Dire uttering mutterings rise and murmur in the crowds. So Savitri is really seeing a very fearful picture of all the, the tyrant and the fury and the jinn. Lie bound in the conscience, cavern the pit. And the beast crawls in his anchor den. Dire mutterings rise and murmur in their crowds. So it's a very fearful picture actually. While Titan and Fury and Jinn, we also have in the Indian tradition similar beings, Asura, Rakshasa, Pishacha, they're all there present in the subconscious. Asura, the mental power, Rakshasa, the vital power, Pishacha, the lower subconscious power, they are there, always present in the subconscious. And it is these Asuras and Rakshasas and Pishacha which the Rishis had to face. The Asuras would go and destroy them, destroy the tapasya, spoil them. Of course, they are very powerful beings. And the famous example is, of course, the example of Ravana himself. His son, Indrajit, was also equally powerful. They are the Asuras. They are present. In fact, the whole of Ramayana is a story not on the human plane. Although the human element is present there, is the occult plane. And the battle is constantly being waged in the occult. All these are beings who are opposing the further advance of evolution. And it is Rama who has to clear them all so that the mental being can come here and be safe, otherwise they will just be swallowed. See? So, in fact, that is the background, that is the way to understand Ramayana. Hanuman, they are all beings of a different order, of a different world, although we think as if they were living amongst us. In fact, there is a very peculiar kind of a mental attitude amongst us. They say that, oh, these people, one or us, how can we be friendly with one or us? With friends in that. That is what the modern mind thinks. 
these fellows had lost their head and they don't know what this is. So they started rationalizing it. Perhaps in those very, very good old days, those creatures were advanced and they used to tie something like a rope on their waist, which looked like a tail and that was used as a weapon for the battle. Then now the modern rational mind rationalizes Vanaras. But actually, Wali, Sugriva, Gambuantra, all these names, they themselves tell you, look, they belong to a different occult world, for the Vati world. And the battle is actually in the occult. Rama was fighting in fact the battle in the occult. And his victory is in the occult. That we generally miss. So the Titan and the Fury and the thing lie bound in the subconscious cavern in the pit. And the beast grovels in his hand and then die mutterings rise and murmur in the drowns. The insurgent sometimes raises his huge head. A monstrous mystery lurking in life's deeps. The mystery of dark and foreign worlds. The dead besieges of the adversary kings. The dreadful powers held down within his depths, within the depths of man. The dreadful powers held within his depths become his masters or his ministers. And arms they invade the body house. In armors they invade his bodily house. Can act in his acts, infest his thought and life. This is the kind of a mischief they will constantly keep on playing. The dreadful powers can act in his acts, in man's acts. He doesn't know. He thinks that he is acting, but there is some other person who is actually acting in him. He faces his thought. He is possessed. He is instigated. He is meant to think that way. And his life and every action now gets governed by them. The greatest example is of course the example of Hitler. As a person, he was a very small creature. But as an instrument of the hostile power, what the mother had called the Lord of Nation, he was a perfect instrument. He would obey him in every respect. Whatever he was commanded to do by him, that he would carry out. And it is because of he being the instrument a perfect instrument of the Lord of Nations that he could win in the early phases of the Second World War. Victory after victory came to him. But only when a divine force to counter that action came into full sway that the tide turned. And then finally he had to disappear. So as far as Hitler is concerned as a being, he was a very small creature. But he was a good instrument for the Lord of Nations work. And he did that thing. Can act in his acts. This is what happens. This is what these people do. Can act in his acts. In face his thought and life, he carries all his life in that manner. We don't know whether we are doing things out of our free will, of our own choice, or whether somebody else is acting from behind and think that it is, oh, I am doing all those things. That is the kind of illusion we generally have. The only safety for us, the guarantee 
the assurance, the protection for us is the psychic being. If our psychic being comes forward and if we are quiet, receptive, calm, to listen to the voices of the psychic being, then we are safe. Then the hostile powers cannot do any mischief at all to us. The dreadful powers held down within his depths become his masters or his ministers. Enormous, they invade his bodily house, can act in his acts, infest his thought and life. Infernal surges into the human air and touches all with a perverting breath. So everything becomes an inferno. Jwala of the Lord is of the hell. It is that that we space around and pervades everything. Now this is the kind of the picture Savitri is seeing when she has entered into the dream consciousness. She has to see many, many more things, but this is just the first entry of us into this vital nature. And all the powers of the vital nature are in full operation here. She has to know these things. Unless she knows them, unless she conquers them, wins the victory over them, she cannot proceed further. So that is what is buried in our past, in our bhuta, in our consciousness of the lower nature in terms of our daily activities.